This is a series of conversations with Robert Hanna, a broadly and radically Kantian independent philosopher who's held research or teaching positions at six different universities in five different countries, and has published more than 150 articles and 11 books on fundamental philosophical issues and problems. Bob's new book, The Fate of Analysis, is a critical revisionist history of the analytic tradition from the 1880s to 6 a.m. this morning that also develops a future-oriented positive conception of what real philosophy can and should be after the impending demise of analytic philosophy. In today's episode, Bob and I discuss philosophy of mind and the awesome power of institutions to shape our thinking, feeling, and action, how to win friends and influence people, the roots of America's academic amnesia problem, the link between logical positivism and popular anti-realism, how to cultivate sustainable and pleasurable group projects, what the results of Cantor, Gödel, and Tarski mean for mechanistic biology and physics, logical incompleteness and quantum uncertainty, what it was that drove Frege's allegiance to logical realism and reductionism, and the question of how philosophy and society ought to relate to the irreducible. I'm glad you're here to join us, and we'll see you inside. Or should I say... Outside, outside, outside. Uh, what's the book about? Uh, well, the, the first one was called Embodied Minds in Action. That was from, she's a former PhD student of mine. Um, and yeah, Embodied Mind in Action in Action was from 2009. And then we wrote a sequel to it um, that we published in 2019 called The Mind Body Politic. So the first one was Heavy Duty Metaphysics of Mind and Metaphysics of Mental Causation. And then the second one was uh, an extension of that approach to mind via what's now called the 3E or 4E approach to cognition, embodied, embedded, and, it, and active. And then sometimes the fourth E is extended, but... Yes, extended, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we reject the extended part. Anyway, um, that's an implication of the of the metaphysics we presented in that earlier book. But anyway, we, ex we developed that in a social philosophy and political context. So the, so the most recent one, Mind Body Politic, as the title suggests, um, is uh, an application of fundamental metaphysics of mind to social and political issues. Well, that sounds, I'm glad to see that happening. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. it seem obvious that this, the end of the encapsulated interior pineal monad-like self becoming saturated into the fragile meat and then the meat bodies being interdependent on each other and then the extension thing, which means that I'm, I'm already parasitic on external structures, isn't this permeability and, and the destruction of the sub the, the 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 membrane between subjects this this new type of metaphysics do you think it's possible that if people have a new model of selfhood that it'll, it'll result in some type of a social change uh well that's the upshot of the book i mean we we because we're rejecting the extended mind approach so that minds are literally spread out into their environment or would be literally spread out into social groups so that there would be some sort of group mind thing going on. What we claim is that social institutions, which we define as people involved in group intentionality, where they're co they have coordinated acts of intentionality and they share norms of activity and so on. Um, so it's a very broad definition of social institution. What we claim is that social institutions necessarily shape us in the sense that they partially causally determine us but also normatively guide us to a non-trivial in fact a very important extent so it's not that it's not that we're determined by strictly determined by social institutions but that we're formed and guided by them basically and, right. and also causally you know triggered or primed and so on. So there's a causal component and a normative component. Um, and because we're committed to 
the essential embodiment thesis, which claims that minds are necessarily and completely embodied throughout living organisms of a certain level of complexity uh, and beyond that level of complexity, i.e. animals mostly. Um, it follows that if we're shaped by our social institutions, then we're literally shaped in all our bodily movements, our lives, you know, from our toes right up to the tip tops of our heads and out to the fingertips and so on. And because the mind is necessarily and completely spread throughout the body um, and complementary to it, then the content of mind is also shaped. In other words, so the, the interior part, the so-called interior part of our, I mean, it is interior, not in a Cartesian sense, but the, the stuff that's hidden from everybody else most of the time um, is actually manifest to some extent on our bodies and through our bodies, in and through our bodies. And so it's not, it's not inherently hidden from everybody else. It's just, you know, um, it's private in some ways, but in any case, um, that's, you know, institutions form us into, in this interior way, this non-Cartesian interior way, as well as um, guiding us and shaping us in our movements and so on. Oop, no. Well, I can certainly see that. It's, it's <clears throat> this, all the secretings going on, being in the office and environment and getting a dirty look, the desire, the, first of all, the automatic mimesis, second, the desire to belong, and all the, the chemical right. going on internally that are miles behind, but eventually fruit as the self. Yep. This is, people have, a, have trouble realizing that, that they're like their mitochondria uh, working or the mm -hmm. activities going on in the cell is just as much selfhood. How, how is that not self yet some tiny area of the frontal cortex? That's the only, that's, that's the autonomous true self. Everything else is, is like a non-existent, like non-existent kind of ignored they'll say yes well that's infrastructure necessary that's like the those are resources for the frontal cortex self but these things certainly don't constitute the consciousness of the self right yeah yeah so we're rejecting that view altogether right um, and then we add to that thesis a distinction between what we call um categorically two categorically distinct kinds of social institutions one that uh, we call, they're basically bad social institutions, destructive, deforming social institutions, and then good social institutions, which we call constructive, enabling social institutions. And then our further, further thesis, which makes it particularly political, is that most, not all, but most of the institutions in contemporary neoliberal states are in fact destructive and deforming to a greater or lesser degree. Although there are still a few and can be at least, or at least can be a few constructive enabling institutions. Then we add to it um, something we call the inactive transformative principle, which is that if you change the institutional structures of an institution, that, chain, that shapes people who live in those institutions or belong to those institutions significantly. Therefore, if you change destructive, deforming institutional structures into constructive, enabling institutional structures, then you make people's lives substantially better. That sounds good. Yeah. And that's, a, that's, that's, that's an interesting process because we're, we're marinating in the in the time and motion environment that we've secreted through our policies. Right. And, and that, that produces certain types of human beings who are likely to, to inertially reproduce these destructive um, yes. ways yep. of, of cooperation. Yes, yep. And, and we define yep. destructive deforming versus constructive enabling in terms of uh, a set of basic well, we call them true human needs, but anyway, it's, it's a theory about human needs. Um, and destructive deforming institutions frustrate or thwart or warp um, fundamental human needs, whereas uh, the satisfaction of, of these true human needs, whereas constructive enabling institutions 
Oh, and secondly, are not guided by principles of dignity. And then constructive enabling institutions satisfy um, and sustain and forward um, the satisfaction of true human needs and are guided by, you know, principles of. That's good. So there's a, va there's a value component and there's also something you can actually measure and you, you have actual definitions in place. So you right. can actually, um, right. you can actually evaluate the success or failure of institutions according to objective criteria. Yeah, exactly. Right. Once you have, you know, we're, of course, in, to make it empirically applicable, applicable, we need to be more detailed about precisely, but you can just ask people whether their needs are being satisfied once you've said, so here's, you know, here's a list of needs and we provide a list of true human needs divided into basic and emancipatory. Um, and emancipatory have more to do with sort of um, higher level interactions between people that have to do with um, communication, cultural, you know, sharing, um, and so on. Right. So there's a, like a Maslow type of a hierarchy, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just that they're, they involve more sophisticated, you know, social and intellectual activities than the basic needs are, you know, obviously, uh, food, shelter, right, right. basic education. So, so let's say, Higher education in the right done in the right way would go into emancipatory human needs as opposed to basic education. Right, right. That's nice. Would go into the, uh, you know, elementary, roughly speaking, through high school education, which would be a basic human need. Um, well, I think it's a good idea to have these things listed out in right. kind of a rigorous index-like quantifiable way, hmm. because common sense and, co and 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 simple reflection is not enough to counteract the, the needs of the shareholders who have things who are very rigorous and have things very quantified and since uh you know, they're they're the the helms people at at work so it's you, you need more than just a yeah more than we, we tried to be as uh unvague as possible even though i mean it's a typical move in particularly professional academic philosophy but in philosophy generally that um if you are too clear and distinct, then you open yourself on the on the debate model of philosophy. You know, winning. You know, zero sum, winner loser debate. Yeah, you model. provide ammo when you're too detailed. Exactly, that's right. So when you when you provide too many, you know, explicit, quite specific claims, then you open yourself to more criticism. On the other hand, we wrote this book in particular, not so much to protect, I mean, not with a protective shell of arguments for and against as much as trying to lay out a clear set of proposals and then I mean, a clear and distinct set of proposals uh, and distinctions and definitions and so on. And then basically inviting people to share the project or, you know, find something wrong with it. Um, you know, so in other words, we, the idea was we're looking for constructive responses to the project. Right. That's always troubling. The next step, once once you lay this stuff out and you have a very rigorous presentation of a good social policy or, or a good design paradigm, then yeah. you have to overcome all these obstacles, like the real obstacles of, of self-interest and people who are invested in not changing. Yes. I mean, and, and we know from history that giving them a good argument and using the peculiar unforced force of the better argument isn't enough to have them voluntarily relinquish and, and allow these, these new systems to grow. So how do you overcome that, that high level filter? Right. Well, and that's, so there's a kind, there's a um, uh, empirically confirmed version of that, which is called the backfire effect. We've probably talked about this, but anyway, um, it's there in cognitive psychology. It's been studied in cognitive psychology and social psychology and so on. And that is that when you present, so someone holds a set of opinions, has a set of beliefs, and suppose that there is objective evidence against those beliefs. It's been shown that if you present the people who hold those beliefs with objective evidence against them, it actually entrenches the beliefs further and makes them exceptionally angry and almost practically impossible to make any progress 
towards, you know, correcting those beliefs and so on. Um, then they go metaphysical. When you provide empirical evidence, yeah. they go <laughs> metaphysical. That this happens in, in, in race and sex spheres, especially. They always yeah, yeah. go off into some weird, weird world. Yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, I mean, lots of people have noticed, you know, the echo chamber phenomenon and that, you know, when you press someone on their, you know, basic ideology, which is ideologies or, you know, uh, identity commitments of various kinds, they generally go ballistic. And that's that's really what the backfire effect is all about, is, is this going ballistic and retrenchment. It makes it harder and harder. So presenting, the, here's the paradox, presenting people with better and better arguments and more and more evidence actually makes it less and less possible for them to admit their errors and uh, move forward. Well, that's a problem for fact-based, reason-based, and uh and like this evidence-based approaches. So, so what's what's the counter, what's the alternative? Well, it turns out that these studies also show that it is actually possible to make some advance uh, in discussions with these people, but it's not, A, it's not going to be in a debate format where people are trying to win points. It's got to be in a dialogical format where people are discussing. That's the first point. The second point is you basically have to validate people's worldviews first to the point where they feel as though they're not being attacked. And then once they feel that they're on a level playing field with you, as far as the discussion is, that you haven't stacked the deck against them or you're not, you know, it's not that you hate them and you're trying to show them who's the cleverest, you're not being moralistic and so on, then you can actually make some advance particularly in again a dialogical format where you're not just saying here's a set of facts accept these facts or you're a fucking idiot you know or accept these facts or you know you're a bad person or something like that it has to be done in this very careful sort of step by step that's an excellent yeah. point they, they, they have to have self-interest to engage in the dialogue and if they know that engagement will result in inevitable defeat they won't even start yes of course that's right and so it turns out that actually important, you know, significant strides can be made forward in this, again, this dialogical slow process. The problem is it's exceptionally time consuming and energy consuming. So, <laughs> yes. And so, and, and I think anyone who's done a lot of teaching, particularly in subjects like you know, uh, value, value theory subjects and so on, but it's also true in more abstruse uh, you know, abstract contexts. Um, but I taught, for instance, uh, an intro ethics course year after year for about 20 years. And you know, you just learn after a while that in order to make really any progress in a course like that, you'd have to have the course for about five years. And you'd have to have it every, you'd have to meet all year round and you'd have to, you know, the people would have to be interested uh -huh. enough to stick with it. But, um, and, and you could go slowly in that way. And so you wouldn't just present them with theses and then a bunch of arguments for the theses. Because what used to happen week after week after week in my intro ethics course was, um, so we'd be discussing, I don't know, pick some, you know, applied ethics issue like abortion or right. capital punishment, you know, pick one of them. Um, and then we'd have this, this is when it was really good and fun. We'd have these, you know, hour long discussions and we would actually, in the course of these discussions, because they were flowing and students generally got along with me and so on, sometimes we could actually make some progress in these discussions. So we might, at the end of the discussion, we might have, and then I would always try before they did the shuffle thing and then ran out of the class, I would always say, so here's what we've learned today. Like, here's where we are in our discussion. And then, so it's at the end of this abortion discussion, we might say, Given a certain view of persons under some conditions, we all agree now, don't we, that it might be permissible to kill a non-person. And then, you know, because they were with it, they were into, you know, the thing. Uh, generally, and they, of course, they were eager to get out of class. But anyway, they would generally say, yeah, we see that point or nobody had any serious objections to it. 
You uh, have to do it that way. Repetition, synopsis, and then bringing the will in affirmation through the, the yeah. judgment. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. And so, but th this is the scary thing. Okay. So the weekend would go by or maybe two or three days. And then on Monday or Tuesday or whatever the first class of the week was, I'd say, so last time, here's where I think we were. You know, and then I repeat the thesis, right? So given a certain account of the nature of right, Christ, then under some, and then they would say, no, pro-life is right, or, you know, pro-choice is right. It just like, it was oh, like, God. They, it was like they'd had their minds wiped clean. That's incredible. Yes, the, yeah. But so, I think so you, you'd make the part, you'd, you'd even, or you repeat it at the end just to let it sink in. And then you repeat it at the beginning of next class. And in that small gap, it was enough to destroy everything. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Uh -uh. Yeah, it's really amazing. But I think it I think it's a I think you know, I didn't have a name for it then, but I, I just called it, you know, like the amnesia problem. But um I think it's it's part and parcel, or rather the backfire effect is is basically what's going on, is that um you can you can move past the backfire effect by this dialogical, careful, non threatening, everybody's, you know, entitled to say something in discussion. We're not we're validating your you know, that's right. That's right. From the start. But in the meantime, they went back into larger society and probably if they thought about it, all, that's another problem. They probably don't think about it at all. And so they're just kind of reaffirming their, you know, identitarian commitments. Right. And, right. and this, and this uh, reaffirms what you said a, a minute ago about the embodied yeah. self. So you, you have, you know, 20 years of biological infrastructure moving in its, it's homeostatic, pattern-preserving way. So how is a small revelation in the cortex enough to overwhelm, you know, 20 years of cellular inertia? Yes. Yeah. Or that's right. And, and or to put it in more, you know, less biologically, biological sounding terms, it's just that people are working with certain kinds of identity commitments. I, and I think this is not at the level of group identity so much, but it sometimes is. But uh, individual identity. So they, they have a working conception that may not be well articulated of who they are and what kind of person they are and that sort of so thing. It's part of self-esteem and self-concept. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, but often these beliefs are so basic, so fundamental that uh, in order to give up, say, their pro-choice or their pro-life commitment, it, they they get scared because they realize that they'd have to change their lives or at least change their self-conception and actually change their lives somewhat. So I think that um, the flipping back phenomenon has in a way to do with reasserting this, you know, conception of themselves that they have, which is probably quite atomistic. So, you know, like a, they have to have this little core of, you know, well-fixed beliefs ticking the boxes and if you gave up any one of those beliefs you'd somehow spin off into the void or you know collapse as a person yeah, that's right that's right i always look for evolutionary biological or psychological yeah, yeah, yeah. explanation for these things and it yeah. must be something like changing your value beliefs might alienate other primates on whom you depend and you don't want to sever any social relations when not necessary so it's better to agree with you know, the people who raised you and the people who you yeah. count as allies because you know that a disagreement with them will, will irk them. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So that's – and the other thing that was scary too was when – so when I would come in and say, so, you know, this is where we were at the end of last class. And then they would say, nope, pro-life, nope, pro-choice, yay, boo. Then I would say, yeah, but don't you remember how we went through the argument? And then, and then I would just kind of – recap the argument very briefly again by way basically by way of a summary from the last class <coughs> and then i say so doesn't that show that the straight the radical pro-choice position is as wrong as the radical pro-life position at the and that the truth must be somewhere in between these or something you know i would say some kind of then the pro-livers will have an incentive to agree <laughs> moderate position but then they would say things like yeah, but you used logic to, you know, mess with our minds to get us to that point. Oh, God. Yep. And I remember one time I was in a pub, in, uh, you know, in, in Boulder, and one of my former students who was a radical pro-life, 
um, who was drunk already when I got in there, and I was just walking by, and I heard her say, supposedly, you know, low in a low voice to her friend, she said, "Oh yeah, there's the prof who tried to mess with my mind and, and, you know, uh, fuck up my pro-life position." It's like, well, this is very interesting. So, so, so for philosophy, well, I guess all reason-based inferential thinking. It, it, it supposes that this idea is true, that taking a, a proposition and unpacking it into a series of smaller, easier to digest and accept propositions is the way to strengthen the conclusion. Uh, so, But in these cases, taking a sentence, going backwards, going up the chain, spelling things out, having them nod their heads at each premise, which will force them to nod their heads at the conclusion, is right. it yielding any results? No, because they they've got this often not not everybody I'm you know but but more often than it should be and perhaps possible perhaps even the majority of students in some cases um, they also have a non a kind of knee jerk anti realist view about you know all kinds of abstract structures oh, and truth and knowledge and inference and so on. And I noticed this when I would go through the little bits of the course on logical theory and so on, is that when push came to shove and they didn't like where an argument was going, then they'd say, yeah, but this is just your game we're playing. This is all socially constructed. You know, and they're getting a lot of this garbage from other departments and so on. But it's also a kind of innate relativism. It's not innate, but, a, you know, a common relativism that's been around for at least 40 or 60 years. Yeah, this, this is the postmodern thing, I guess, where there's like yeah. there's there's like two kinds of truth. There's the real true truth, the one that hits that hits you viscerally, and right. then there's the one that tricky people will get you to nod your head at as a, as an inference, as a necessary inference, even though you agree in the premises, and even though you agree that it's valid, right. Right. you still insert that in another dimension, there's another quality of truth that's more important than that one. Yeah. And so they would say things like, yeah, but I mean, the ones who were, you know, clever in their anti-realism and conventionalism would say, yeah, but even logic and mathematics are just games, oh, you know, you just set up a set of rules and then, you know, and the other ones would say things like, yeah, but it's just what, you know, communities impose on us or we agree to or, I mean, you know, kind of gutter conventionalism. But, you know, to get back to, uh, or we haven't really gotten there yet, but to get back to earlier discussions about the analytic tradition um as it were i sometimes blame the you know it's not blame and the like oh they were horrible people but i think it's certainly an uh an unfortunate consequence of the importance of the vienna circle and logical conventionalist approaches uh, conventionalist approaches to logic and mathematics in particular that Although they were highly science oriented, those people, and they were scientistic, you know, to the nth degree, um, the conventionalism and the corresponding anti realism seeped into popular culture. And by the end of the 60s, it was a standard thing for college. I mean, it wasn't that they were studying the Vienna, you know, it wasn't like they were studying logical positivism and so on particularly, although they might have been, or empiricism, but the conventionalist thought had really seeped into everyday thinking and, uh, you know, amongst, you know, people who cared about that sort of thing. And then it was weaponized by the wrong people. He, who, would, who would ever exactly. think that the people on the right would be able to use that as, as a foothold? Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. why so it, was weaponized. it was weaponized in various ways, both by the left and the right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, people at Duke thought Rick Roderick wasn't sufficiently radical because he, he was pro Habermas and anti Foucault. But this was the very reason. If you don't, if you can't use reason and logic as as a, as a power, then what, what are you doing in philosophy? Right. Yes. Yeah, and I spent a lot of time writing about, and in fact, read a whole book about the idea that um, basic logical principles are innate very simple ones are innate and they're uh, also expressed in the grammars of all human languages. This is sort of Chomsky in thought and they're basically normative in character. So the idea is they're, they're, 
they're part of the background of what yep. constitutes a rational. Yeah, the, the consensus drive is like a Kantian regulative um, attractor in the mere act of thinking. Right. Yep. Yes, absolutely. So that to the extent that we can offer reasons for claims, and everybody does, you know, offer reasons for claims. I mean, even those people who are defending conventionalism, defending relativism, and so on, they're still offering reasons for the claims and that they, you know, that they think that the conventionalist or relativist conclusion follows from a set of premises. Uh, the very fact that they're doing that means that they're presupposing very minimal, you know, logical consequence principles, very minimal uh, consistency principles. That's right, right. right. This, this is the famous self-defeat of relativism. Yes, although I think that there are obviously more subtle and less subtle versions of it, right? Um, but in any case, I think that anyone who's prepared to discuss anything and offer reasons for any claims is presupposing a minimal logic, um, which is also there not just as a theoretical, you know, grid in their minds, but as a normative grid as well, because it's it's providing a set of minimal conditions for what counts as rationality. I mean, it doesn't mean we use the, these these minimal capacities properly by any means, because how, you can. So how, how do we design an effective politics with that information? So we know that there are people that are like this, and we know that there's this tendency that you talked about earlier to dig in even harder with a metaphysical rejection. Right. So uh, so. What do you do to someone who who's in the next week says, no, I don't agree. I'm pro-life again. I mean, what's what's well, I think I think well, here's, here's the thing. I think you can make progress, but it's slow. It's got to be dialogical. You've got to be on it week after week and maybe a couple of times a week. And again, it's tremendously time consuming and energy consuming. And the person who is involved in this process of you know, it's really radical education or something like that, you know, radical pedagogy um, has to, you can't force them to be there, right? Because that's coercive. And so anything that comes out of a coercive situation is not going to be legitimate. It's not going to be rationally legitimate or, or morally legitimate. So they've, that somehow or another, they've got to want to show up week after week after week. That's right. Yeah. And and, and if, if their self-esteem and self-concept depends on like integrity with whatever past situation raised them, then they'd have no motive to throw it unless they were like psychedelics lovers or like self-transformation lovers. And those people like that do exist. You know, I'm one of them. Yes. But so unless yeah. the, unless they enjoy the idea of being challenged and then liquefied and then recrystallizing in a better way after the after the experience, they, they'd have they would avoid that they would want to be reinforced and, and they'd, they'd seek as much echo chamber as possible. Yes. It's also the case having, so I guess from the time I started in college, um, certainly all the way through, you know, late part of undergraduate work and graduate school, I've been running or participating in discussion groups of various kinds. We just, it's just a habit I got into. And, uh, and prior to that, of course, it was, like, you know, the ball hockey game that was there every Saturday morning. It's not, this is not an educational thing, but just like a bunch of us getting together to play basketball or, or you know, ball hockey or whatever. I noticed that, and have, this is true, no matter how into it people are at the beginning, let's say you've got 20 or 30 people into some group activity. If it's not highly structured and it depends more on just, you know, a, a love of what it is that they're doing, um, they typically fall away. And so after six months or five weeks or whatever it is, inevitably in these groups, all the way back to these sporting activities that, you know, sort of free form sporting activities that we're involved in, sooner or later, six months down the line, whatever, it was me and one other person. <laughs> so what do you mean by highly structured? Well, I mean, so, so, I played hockey, for instance, up to a reasonably high level, you know, like uh, juvenile or something like that. So that's like 16, 17, just before you get to the pro stream, you know, for the really good players and so on. Now, hockey played in Canada of that kind 
when you sign on for a hockey team, A, you pay for the thing, you know, B, your coaches are extremely disciplinary and you practice three times a week or four times a week. So you've got this highly structured and quite coercive in a way because, you you know, you've already paid for it and, you know, the coaches can punish you. And it's and, interesting that we, that we seek that out and, and that we, we feel like it's an investment. Yes. And, you know, and uh, it's being Canada and so on. There were a lot of kids who not only just loved hockey, but also had, you know, ideas of maybe playing at the college level and possibly beyond that at the pro level. Um, and so they were invested oh, and their parents are totally invested in this, too. Um, so it's a much more, well, quasi coercive, but certainly quite rigid structure. Uh, and, you know, pe- anyone who's taken, you know, been involved in team sports or, or actually individual sports, you know, in a serious way, they know it's quite, you know, you've got to be highly self-disciplined. You've got to stick to the rules. Your coaches tell you what to do. You've got to do what your coaches say. Um, right. And so as opposed to what I actually really preferred was these free form, you know, just a bunch of folks showing up every single Saturday morning to play ball hockey until we were dead on our feet. And then we would stumble home and rest for the rest of the day. Um, well, that's, that's, you're, you're, you're a mutant. You're, you're missing the fascism gene. <laughs> if only you, you had more of that, you'd, you'd be more appreciative of coercion. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's why eventually I didn't do so well in team sports is sooner or later it would come out that I just didn't feel like going to practice and I would just, or, or I was tired of the coach, you know, f- telling us what to do. And I would just say, I'm tired. I'm going home now. I'm hungry. I want to go home for dinner or something like that. And, and almost all of my coaches at some point would say, Bob, you're playing your own game. Like, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not quite, I'm not quite with the program, but and that's why I, pre- yeah. but, it, but, but the, the flip side of, you know, preferring freeform versions of whatever sport it was I was involved in is that it's, it's very hard to get people to commit week after week after. And you, again, you can't force them, you know? Um, so how do, how do you, you leverage this interesting insight into improving the efficacy of uh, transformative pedagogy? Well, I'm not, this, this is the thing I'm not at all sure about is, you know, I don't really have an answer to this question. So how do you, um, <clears throat> avoid or make it less and less likely that people will bag out of something that they're volunt- you know, fully freely involved in, but it's, it's work in the sense that, you know, it's a lot of time and energy, not work in the sense that they're being paid for it or, <clears throat> you know, they're being forced to do it in any way. Um, but it's work in the sense that it requires a lot of time, energy and commitment. How do you, sustain that. That's really hard. I don't have a good answer to that question, unfortunately. Well, look at organizations like Scientology, where people in the Sea Org make 10 or $20 a week, and they work like 20 hour days. And they love it. They love it because they yeah. feel like they're participating in the salvation of humanity, I guess. I yeah, guess. well, one thing you can try to do is, you know, emphasize the solidarity and, you know, sort of non-instrumental value component of it. Um, you know, why do you, why do you show up for this? Because I love it and because it's good and it's good for, you know, it's good to do this kind of activity and the more we do it, you know, the more fun it is. And, you know, even though it's work and so on, but uh, I haven't yet found the magic. (laughs) I haven't yet found the magic, uh, not bullet, but sort of fix so that, uh, people will just show up forever and ever for these kinds of projects. No. <clears throat> Unfortunately. Um, but to come back to where we started, namely the overcoming the backfire effect, there's extra reason, you know, there, there's extra um, bonds, mental slavery bonds that have to be gradually loosened you know, mind manacles that need to be gradually loosened session after session, week after week, you know, but the thing is that the people have to do it themselves. You can make, you can kind of prime them right. for it and you can, you know, encourage them and be as validating as, you know, try to help them 
through it without pushing them around or anything like that. Um, but because loosening the, you know, the mind manacles is a somewhat painful process and also, you know, disorienting and so on, unless someone really feels that this is the way to salvation, you know, or self transformation, <clears throat> and you might get a few people involved who are committed to it in that way. Most other, right. you, there, there has to be a will already in there wanting, yeah. wanting the results. And the only way for these new, new ways of, chink, of thinking to, to settle in is for the actual authentic agent inside the person is really willing the, the premise and the conclusion and the affirmation is really felt. And if, if the affirmation isn't felt, then nothing's going to, nothing's going to change. Yes. And so some, <clears throat> yeah. And so I, I, I've thought about possible ways of trying to <clears throat> make it easier for people to not just engage initially, you know, with lots of interest in it and so on, but sustain that over time. I mean, they're just, you know, somehow has, there's this thing that Brazilians call um, concordar, which, um, you know, in Portuguese, which means shared heart. And I think that basically every social interaction which uh, is of this constructive enabling sort has concordar built into it. You know, it's, so it's part of the institutional structure is that people um, share fundamental commitments and values and they see, even if they don't necessarily articulate it to themselves, they grasp in an intuitive way what's so great about this kind of thing That's and right. they don't get pooped out you know but there are so many other distractions you know in an ordinary life um <clears throat> like a job for instance or you know <laughs> family commitments or whatever pulling in various ways um and those are just the sort of obvious ones um right that's a good again, point it's very hard to stay focused so <clears throat> you yeah, know there'd have to be um no one wants to be alone in their belief. So, so one of the one of the criteria would, would be that this is shared, or even this view is a majority view inside of our group. And I guess that that's yeah. how you, that's how, that's how these people that join cults really change their minds, is because it's, the view isn't strange in their group. In fact, it's consensus. Yeah, go. Yeah. yeah, but anyone you know, even in a more ordinary, non-cultic way, anyone who's again has played team sports knows there's this thing. It's not a thing, but there's a phenomenon called team spirit. And, you know, when, you know, when you're in the groove and the team is in the groove and everybody's playing together and it's an amazing thing, actually. And it's yep. not coercive. You know, it's just it's just amazing to be playing well with a bunch of other people who love the thing that they're doing. And that can carry over into, you know, non-sport um, environments. And that's the sort of thing I think that would have to be an, an essential feature or at least a necessary feature of every constructive and yeah, people are dying for that especially in the US which thrives on on like maximal atomized antagonism people are dying yeah. to experience what we imagine like the body cells must experience when they're working together for the sake of mm -hmm. the alleged unity of the body and, and religious right. feel like they get to participate as cells in, in God's body and I guess Hegel is kind of this way we all we're dying to serve a higher order of implementation entity. We're, we're dying to participate in something like that. I mean, we say that we we want to be lone heroes, but really the greatest the greatest thing is the uh, and uh, like the 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 bhakti uh, Indian uh, uh, systems are really big on this. It's like there's no satisfaction like the satisfaction of serving the higher cause. Yeah, or just this you know shared heart. I mean, everyone is you know. Um, sharing the same values and they, they feel them reciprocally with each other. And so they have bonds to each other through this, you know, this social institutional structure. Uh, I mean, the problem with, you know, bonds of that kind is they can be for better or for worse, right? So you can, it is possible to produce something very like Concordar or, you know, in fascist, um, settings and in cult you know in, in means they're obviously a bit in cult 
activities too, along with a lot of other weird coercive junk that's going on. But, um, you know, and people can use it as a way of, you know, bringing lonely people into, you know, group settings where they, you know, as you say, they feel like they belong to something finally. Um, so the, the, the power of the emotions involved in it is, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? There, it's I was want to say it's not fragile, but it's um, it can be, as it were, used for good or for evil, um, you know, or it can or it can you know evolve towards good or for or or evil. Um, but the power of the emotions involved would be just as strong, and sometimes even stronger in the evil case because they're in this they're locked into this mechanical twisty, you know, you do what I tell you and then I'll love you. If you don't do what I tell you, I'll hit you and punish you and everybody will hate you and throw us, throw you out of our group. So you better do what I tell you because I love you, you know, sort of like, and gaslighting strategies and yeah, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you because you're not doing what I, I'm telling you to do, but I really love you deep down inside. It's for your good. I love you. I love you. I love you. Now I hate you. I'm going to kill you unless you do this thing that I'm telling you, but I love you, you know, that kind of weirdo shit that people use right. typically and, you know, in abusive relationships, but also in like individuals, but in these cults of, you know, so. that's right. And the best way to stop that, the, the tension of that is to just love big brother unconditionally. Yes. So when, when the chocolate rations are raised yeah. from 20 to 12, you're yeah. actually happy and in agreement. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's called the, um, the Munich effect. I think it's the Munich effect, where um, people who have been kidnapped or are held by held hostage by terrorists and so on, uh, very often they just capitulate completely and become part of the, you know, like the Patty Hearst phenomenon. Oh, the Stockholm syndrome. The Stockholm. That's it. Stockholm. Yeah, not Munich. Stockholm. Yeah, Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's because right. it's just you know, it's it's, it's, it's more it's biological e economy. It's internal dis uh, uh, dissonance economy. Yes, but it also just resolves a huge emotional problem and conflict that you have, um, which is they, comp you know, they control you completely, and if you push against them, it's they're exhausting. going to exhausting. Yeah, yeah, it's exhausting, and they're going to kill you or do something awful to you. Um, so it's much, much easier just to um, capitulate, basically. So there's a section of your writing that I wanted to bring up. I hate to switch gears because this is a good conversation. Yeah, where you were talking about post-analytic philosophy and uh, replacing the scientism with a pro-scientific anti-scientism. I really love that. And also of uh, something post-mechanist. So how is how would this be carried out and uh, what exactly would this mean? Well, they, so the, that, <clears throat> those remarks were against the backdrop of, um, a fundamental distinction between two kinds of worldview. I mean, there are obviously different kinds of worldview, but um, a mechanistic worldview, which I take to be characteristic of scientism in particular, but also um, the metaphysics and also ideology of the natural sciences and the formal sciences and larger technocratic science-driven culture from at least the end of the 19th century up, you know, to 6 a.m. this morning, this mechanistic worldview. Uh, and what you get is a particular conception or a set of conceptions of the, you know, foundational formal and natural sciences, but it also bleeds into down or whatever, percolates up or bleeds down. Um, into technological applications or applied sciences. I see. Okay. This is and day life, right? And daily life, and then that's to be contrasted categorically with what I call the or those that I'm talking to about this, an organicist conception of the world, which has its origins somewhat in uh, romantic thinking, you know, uh, German romanticism uh, and British romanticism. And so it's, some, so it's a somewhat, uh, and connected in that way to some aspects of absolute idealism. And it goes back to 
Kant's view of life and the nature of organisms in the, you know, the second half of the third critique. Um, but it was also developed systematically by philosophers like Bergson, not quite so systematically, but uh, Whitehead, for instance, and process philosophers. Um, but also Whitehead had tremendous influence on uh, work on organismic biology in and around Cambridge uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and this also influenced, this kind of work influenced John Dewey, uh, you know, in the US um, and other philosophers. And then the organicist tradition, and they were all pro-science. It's just that they had a very different view from the mechanists about what the fundamental nature of the physical, you know, in particular the physical world, but also the physical and, you know, what the mind, mental and physical relationship was and okay, so right, so I wasn't sure how to take this. Were, were you saying that we should make a Kantian separation between mechanism and only belongs in the in the phenomena and we could say yes it belongs to physics, but when it comes to like human organization or social engineering, we shouldn't apply a mechanistic model model to, to like um to, to to human life management or or policy or politics. Uh, or well, society. that's if if the domain of facts is fundamentally organic then you shouldn't apply mechanistic models to it because you'll fuck it up. So you're saying something else. You're saying that that even like like there are certain physicists who think that biology, I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, biology is more fundamental than physics, and physics is kind of like a, an aspect of a larger law system, yes. yep. which includes yep. the negentropic as an essential ingredient. So right. physics right. is actually like truncated, anemic biology, and there's a proto-science yes. deeper than physics, which accounts for negentropy. So you're yeah, saying that mechanism, even applied to physics, is, is somehow off. It is. Yeah. So, yeah. So I take a, this is what I mean by, in part, what I mean by being pro-scientific anti-mechanist. So the anti-mechanism says, no, the world is not universally an automaton of some kind or a machine of some kind. And then you have to be careful about how to, how to define mechanistic or mechanical systems. Um, and then with the claim is that, no, in fact, physical reality uh, is of a is of a categorically distinct structure, and mechanical systems are fragments. They're systematic fragments of that. Look, you right, know, right, 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 right. The, they're they're, they're bits structure. and pieces that ne they never had the opportunity to hook up into an into an organism. So, so they're uh, acting well, they're acting they're acting strangely and autistically by themselves, and they're merely neg in their merely entropic ways. Yes, but here's the here's the analogy that always has force for me. And of what the relationship between um, organic phenomena and mechanical phenomena is, what the relationship is. And that is, so take the real number system, right, which embeds the rationals and, you know, the naturals. Now, basically, the natural numbers are a mechanical system. They're, you know, <clears throat> they're decided. Oh, that's excellent. That's an excellent so, model. And from them, we can produce the rationals. But no matter what, you can never get anything on the diagonal using the natural. So obviously, there's a failure. That's it. But the thing is that the the naturals are a fragment, a systematic fragment, and the you know and the and the arithmetic that deals with natural numbers, basic arithmetic, and so on, that deals with the natural numbers, is a systematic fragment of mathematics as applied to the real numbers. So, in a, in, a, in a quite intelligible way, the natural number system is logically supervenient on the real number system, and operations over the naturals are logically supervenient. That's on, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, so, you, so you're taking a, co a consequence of completeness and making it into an ontological distinction. Yeah. And so generally, that's the thought, is that mechanical systems, yes, of course they exist. Um, but their fragments, their abstractions, systematic abstractions from a much, much richer structure and set of structures. And the trick, though, is to see how the richer structures fund and ground the mechanical structures and not commit what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which is to 
take something that's abstract and systematically dependent on on some deeper, richer phenomenon, and then claim that that's what's really real, and then try to interpret. Right, right. The yeah, deep the intelligible structures. the intelligible parts that we used for our recursive constructions, we've mistakenly made as interpreted as being more basic than that's the it. than the asymptotes that would that they can never reach. But actually, it's the that's inverse. It. That's it. Yeah. And so, in in a quite you know, if you try to apply decidability to, you know, basically arithmetic using real numbers or rather transfinite arithmetic and so on, it just you'd be led to paradoxes. And it just it would just fail to work. Oh, that's awesome! That's so great. Yeah. Now I'm getting a better a, a, a grasp of what you're doing. That's so that's that's a really great way to schematize this issue for people who really don't have a clear understanding of what is this richer understructure that analytic philosophy is ignoring. What is this? This sounds very touchy feely to me. <laughs> well, you can just whip out the diagonal argument and say here's an ex here's an instance of what I'm talking about, and then they'll get it. Yeah, and in fact, recently I've been writing. I mean, I wrote up a couple of long manuscripts with a lot of these ideas in them, but recently I've been writing short essays that just apply the kind of the, the uh, nubs of those ideas in a way that I want to be as clear and, you know, short and crisp as possible, um, and arguing for the formal analogy, and in fact, I think exact analogy between incompleteness in a logical mathematical sense, good incompleteness, and the incompleteness of physics. And then, if this analogy works, then the upshot of the Goodall argument is that you need <coughs> sources of truth and knowledge that are outside logical mathematical systems uh, of a Principia Mathematica sort. Similarly, I claim you need to have primitive sources of natural, what I call creativity, but it's basically negentropic, you know, energy flows um, outside of equilibrium, you know, computable um, systems governed by natural laws of, that are of a strict character, either deterministic or indeterministic, um, such that, you know, every few, according to the internal structure of these systems, um, the second law of thermodynamics is uh, holds for them, and every future fact is necessitated according to these laws from the all the fixed mechanical, you know, quantitative fact about the past together with the laws of nature, and so I call those, you know, mechanical systems, like mechanical physical systems, um, but the idea is that mechanical physical systems, including the systems characteristic of the standard models of cosmology and particle physics, including the way that relativity and quantum mechanics has evolved, leads to basically paradoxes um, of the same kind that the attempt to fold or map the truth definition of a formal system into the system leads to produces instances of the liar paradox. In a natural right, right. setting, it leads to paradoxes of quantum mechanics, basically. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So um, that, 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 that brings up two thoughts. First is that, hooray, because we've always felt that paradoxes are indicative of something interesting and fantastic, but we didn't know how to make good on it. So when, right. when, you, when you, like Rudy Rucker talks about this, like when you see a paradox, it just gives you chills and makes you excited, but then you're like, shit, what can I do with this? Right. So what you're saying, what we can do with it is we can make it into an ontological, regulative like, kind of motivator. Yes. And, the, and, and again, the, what happened in, uh, you know, uh, Gödel's theorems and in Tarski's semantic conception of truth was they both saw very clearly that you had to move the definition of truth and the theory of truth and knowledge, whatever provides knowledge of truth outside of these formal systems. And there, ha there's, there has to be an inexhaustible supply um, of axioms, you know, in order for there to be, you know, logical mathematical systems of the appropriately consistent sound um, 
and incomplete sort. Similarly, in the physical context, there has to be an inexhaustible source, according to me anyway, there has to be an inexhaustible source of causal power and the production of mass energy uh, in order for there to be uh, incomplete physical systems of an entropic second law of thermodynamics behaving right. equilibrium systems. Um, and so I say, you know, like the ultimate naturally creative source is the Big Bang. But um, for every physical system, there has to be, you know, if this line right. of argument works, right. for, every, for every mechanical physical, physical system, there has to be a source of natural creativity outside. Right, right. And it's, outside. our current best model for that is that's supposed to be brain impact, brain collision. <clears throat> yeah, or just, you know, I decide to, you know, so I postulate that. Oh, so it brings God back is, is what it does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Scott, the rational human animal capable of deciding to move his arms in such and such a way is the relevant natural sort, the relevant primitive source of natural creativity for the mechanical system, which is the relative, you know, the, the standard models description of your body movement. Scott Prime. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, pseudo Scott, you know, yeah, the, the one that can be predicted by, uh, you know, can be measured by, you know, our, you know, standard measuring devices, and that um, when we restrict, you know, causal activity within the frame of the speed of light, um, and so on, and then take a relative, right, right, right. relativity, quantum mechanical view of things, um, then that's the description we get the mechanical, you know, description. Right. We get. This, this kind of thinking came up with uh, chaos physics. Remember, they said, "Oh, it turns out that actually what we've been teaching all along has been a subset of real physics. It's damped and driven. If yes. it's damped and driven, then you take care of all this other stuff that causes, you know, these these exponential um, widenings of initial conditions. We 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 uh, oh, I didn't realize it was damped and driven. That really is a subset." Yeah, so that's the that's the general thought that yeah, fragmentary, you know, systematic fragments or um, systematic abstractions from the richer structural system that is the universe. Right? So here's a question that the, that comes up now. So is it uh, are these further, deeper, richer layers going to be um, um, assimilable to law articulation, or are they in principle forever outside po such? Well, they've got the, no, they've got laws too. It's just that the laws governing them are of a peculiar sort because they've got to allow for non-equilibrium spontaneity and, you know, um, normativity and mind um, and so on. So that, that mindedness and normativity and negentropic activity more generally, asymmetric time, um, these are all built into these deeper structures, and you can then provide laws, but the laws are, as you might say, evolving. So in other words, they're not, you've got a... It's the whitehead component. Yes, yeah, the whitehead component, and for you know individual critters like us, we're sources of one-off, what I call one-off laws of physical activity. But you think that these laws will be uh, uh, expressible in algebra? Um, no. I mean, the best you'll be able to do is to uh, provide laws of a general sort which have gaps for constants, and then you're going to have to insert, or rather assume, the existence of certain constants as primitive sources. Um, and then at that point you have to have what I call natural piety, which is you're going to, you're going to have to accept that physics um, isn't the be all and the end all. That's so lovely. What a great idea that is. Yeah, and then so I wrote up a a, a, a little essay called um, let's see if I can get the title right: How to Complete Quantum Mechanics, or What It's Like to Be a Naturally Creative Boomian Beable. Now, Bohmian Beables are uh, 
what he calls hidden, like David Bohm. Oh, this is David Bohm's Im implicit wrapped up interiority. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't go into his later metaphysics. What I'm really interested in actually is his hidden variables approach to uh, how to resolve quantum paradox and in particular, like two slit experiment. Oh yeah, he, he, has, yeah. he has an actual pilot wave. So it, it's a real exactly. physical thing. That's, that's it, yeah. So what I, what I claim is that uh, Bohm was mistaken in thinking that the hidden variables were actually deterministic variables. What I think is that they're getting, thinking again along the lines of Gödel and completeness and so on, that they're actually extra systematic, extra mechanical systematic variables, uh, or rather you, you know, you insert the constants into those spots, um, and every one of them is a naturally creative source, and so the pilot wave is actually expressing natural creativity and guides, I mean, what's really, I really see, you know, the, the pilot wave is the interface, it's the Kantian third between the creative realm and, and the mechanical observable one. Or even to put it more sort of uh, crassly, it's a wavicle. It's, not, it's, it's both a wave and a particle and it has aspects of both, so it's got that complementarity element built into it, and it's got, and it's also, it's not a local hidden variable, it's a non-local hidden variable, so it's not constrained in its causal powers by the speed of light or by general relativity, and that this, I think those features are generally pervasive in the non-mechanical universe, you know, the non-mechanical parts of the universe, and so, including the Big Bang, but also all the little bangs like us uh, and, you know, zillions of other little bangs for every every mechanical physical system. Um, and that in order to understand why it is that the particle, which, you know, seemingly is somehow both half in one slit and half in the other slit and so on, and then the wave, but the wave determines which slit it actually goes through, is to, roughly speaking, imagine of imaginatively project yourself into the wavicle, the wave particle, and let it determine itself. Let itself determine which slit it goes through. I mean, which slit, you know, the particle component of the overall wave uh, as it rolls through, goes through. And the thing is, you can't predict it unless you were the wavicle itself. Interesting. So is, is, is the decision by the wavicle truly a gentive ex nihilo, or is it a kind of an unconscious uh, unfolding of something prior to it? Um, well, I think it's, I think it's proto agentive. That's the, that's the, that's the thought is that, that what we are in a highly sophisticated rational agentive way is what every wavicle is um, in a proto agentive, you know, a negentropic spontaneous evolve, evolution of the you know physical world from the big bang forward that's the thought and so the the physicists in order to understand what's going on again in you know these situations which uh look like quantum mechanical puzzles and you know somehow on the copenhagen interpretation require intervention by the experimenter and all this kind of stuff they really just have to recognize that they have to just let the wavicle be and do its thing and then measure whatever can be measured. Okay, so this takes the observer out. There's no observer caused collapse here then. No, yeah, so superposition and the collapse of the, you know, the so-called collapse of the wave function and so on is a natural, well, it's, it's what natural creativity looks like to someone who's looking for a mechanistic explanation to what's going on. So again, physics is not the be all and the end all. That is to say mechanistic physics certainly is, isn't the be all and the end all. You can have an expanded organicist physics, but at crucial points, it's got to just allow quantities to evolve in nature and then again measure whatever can be measured.
and the the, the Schrodinger wave equation doesn't suffer from this problem of uh, of collapse. You know, it's completely deterministic entirely throughout its lifetime. Well, the thing is that I think there's a mistake there, like a philosophical mistake about what deterministic means in this context. So, uh, and I think there are two, in this little essay, I also suggest there are two fundamentally different conceptions of deterministic that are in play here. One of which is basically repeating classical determinism in philosophy and, you know, in, in metaphysics. Um, necessitation according to laws, given all the facts, uh, you know, uh, um, settled facts about the past. But the other kind of deterministic is that processes fix all the details of actual situations down to the finest grain, finest grain allowable in nature. So deterministic in that context means determinative, like determines all the, the grain, fixes all the grain of nature all the way down. And I think that basically Schrodinger's equation is talking about determination in the second sense and not in the first sense. It doesn't need to be combined with, you know, uh, universal natural determinism in the philosophical sense. Right. Well, yeah, it shouldn't be because it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a probability that's being determined and not, and not, the, not a specificity. Yeah. Well, it, it, it fixes all the quantity facts whether probabilistic or non-probabilistic. That's the crucial. So it's, yeah. So it's, so it, it gets you all the grain of nature. Oh, I see. Uh, all the way down for all the particles and all the, you know, wavicles and all the forces and so on. It, it makes sure that every value is a real number, but it doesn't tell you what it is yet. Yes, it, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it does, is... yeah, does the determinative work but it doesn't need to be combined with a deterministic metaphysics. And I think that both, I don't know about Schrodinger so much, but certainly Bohm, the earlier Bohm, was not so clear about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Well, this is, this is great. What, that was, you know, getting your model and following your discussion there was uh, one of the most pleasant experiences I've had in the last few years. It was really, really good. <laughs> All right. Nice. But anyway, yeah, to come back to, you know, what happens when we're finished with post-classical, if, you know, assuming it, it doesn't turn into a thousand year Reich, um, you know, when post-classical analytic philosophy really does collapse uh, or go into the ash heap of history, if it does, um, <clears throat> and at the same time, there will have to be a fundamental reorientation of the relation between philosophy and the professional academy. I think, um, then it seems to me it would be possible for a view like the one I was just sketching to replace, you know, the scientific mechanism. Right. Um, so, part, so part of what you're saying here isn't that uh, philosophy should stop using science as a model. Rather, right. uh, science needs to catch up to these recent discoveries and change its own model. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, we need to change our fundamental conceptions of nature, you know, generally shared conception of nature, and correspondingly change our views of the nature of physics and biology and the other fundamental sciences, just in the way that when you really think them through, Goodall and Tarski fundamentally changed our way of thinking about formal systems in a, in a way that, that was absolutely brilliant and mind-blowing, and that, you know, people who, even people who work in mathematical logic haven't really quite cottoned on to, you know, precisely what they did to <laughs> the logicist tradition, um, you know, back in the 30s. That's right. Well, because because predicate logic is uh, gives us an excellent handle on on huge swaths of reality. Everything you can formulate as a proposition is its slave. So it is quite a discovery. Oh, it's an amazing discovery. And when you when you project you know, discovery of incompleteness and discovery of the irreflexivity of truth inside formalized systems um, against the backdrop of a broadly transcendental approach to logic that, you know, Kantians had um, prior to Hegel and the, you know, the idealist, you know, the obviously post-Kantian tradition. Um, and you 
frame it against something like Wittgenstein's thought that wherever there are facts, you know, the world is the world of facts, right? So the world is all that is the case, it's all facts, but facts are structured to conform to logic. That's what facts are. Facts are the sorts of things that can be represented by propositions, and propositions belong to larger logical structures and systems. And so, roughly speaking, the you know metaphysical deduction tells us, you know, the first critique tells us that reality, to the extent that we're that it's manifestly real to us, is going to have the general form in its factual character is going to have the general form of propositional logic. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think the the factual world is the world designed for, or rather, necessarily conforming to uh, our propositional logical ways of representing it. Yes, uh, that's that's something Longinus emphasizes in, in her book. She's right. talking about what needs to be the case about perceptual experience so that it can conform to not just the, the form of judgment but a form of judgment that itself has been engineered in order to fit into an inferential web system. Yes. Yeah. Now, my take on that, I mean, just now going back to the Kantian stuff, but also looking forward to what I was describing as the organicist worldview uh, primed and inspired in a way by thinking about good and completeness and Tarski's semantic conception of truth is that, uh, there's a fundamentally non-conceptual, essentially non-conceptual character to human cognition and the world also conforms to that and the forms of, of mental representation, the forms of representation we use to access that. So what are those forms of representation? Is that, is that more than Kant's intensive magnitude? Uh, well, it's spatial and temporal representation, but it's also direct reference. I mean, just think of everything that went in there. Oh, and also the representation of force and motion and intensity through, I mean, what Kant called imagination allows us to represent force, motion, and intensity. Um, intuition allows us to do direct reference. The forms of intuition allow us to represent spatial and temporal structure. Once we've got spatial and temporal structure in place, then we've got models for geometry and arithmetic. Um, when, when we've got the models of, say, the natural numbers or whatever built into the structure of time, then we can add a logical component to it and get, you know, logical mathematical um, systems. But you cannot fix the meaning of number terms, it turns out, you know, the so-called Caesar problem. You can't fix the meaning of number terms um, using a purely set theoretic approach to um, the numbers. Uh, it under it underdetermines what counts as the numbers because they all satisfy a bunch of set theoretic axioms, one-to-one -one correspondence and so on uh, of sets to sets. So the claim that I committed to is we need fundamental models that we access externally to, you know, set theoretic mathematical systems to tell us what the natural numbers are. And that Kant was basically right in thinking that that's bound up with the, Space and time. Repre yeah, the representation of time. Right. So time no, that's, 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 that's Brower's intuitionism. Well, well he, he doesn't go it's into the phenomenology. Yes. Yes. He, yes. he gets as far as the tuity. The tuity is the, 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 the phenomenological basic of the number experience. It, yeah, it's close to Brower's thought anyway. I mean, with, you know, the details would be different, but because the, the view I'm sketching isn't constructivist, it's structuralist. I mean, it's got a constructive component, but the idea is that you get, that's why it's time as a whole, a, you know, W-H-O-L-E, as opposed to time as just this progressive set of operations of oneity and twoity and, you know, all that kind of stuff. The idea is that you get the natural number system as a complete structure um, by formal intuition. Uh, and then we learned that event, you know, we eventually learned that through Cantor and so on that, you know, there are, there are richer number systems 
and that the, the further claim then is we're non-conceptually aware of those. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> not just through the representations of, well, through the representation of sp space-time as a continuum. Here's um, a question. This is going to yeah. sound like a really stupid question, probably. So the set theoretical um, um, modeling of uh, the natural numbers, was this supposed to be something like uh, a, a non, an uninterpreted model, because these the formal systems are, are they're all about their virtue is that they have as little interpretation going on as possible. It's just the relational uh, mechanics and the rules of inference, and that's it. We have, we're not saying anything about, what, about what's going on inside. But how is set theory an uninterpreted, interpretation-free, unmodeled modeling of the of the natural numbers? Well, the so uh, Frigo was trying to get you know, transformative analysis going by giving a definition or, you know, definitions of the natural numbers in terms of what he regarded as a deeper, you know, more fundamental structure, which as, as it turns out, I think was a fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So, and he, he thought, he thought he had set theory ready to hand to help himself to something more basic than the numbers. I see. And then he defined the numbers in terms of one-to-one -one corresponding sets. Right, right. So, so this is the, uh, your idea of, of, of a transformative analysis, right? Yeah. And that, so, so that, but, but, but he blew it because he blew it because set theory was afflicted with paradox as Russell discovered. But don't you think that there's a more basic problem, which is that you can't cognize the set of all pairs, the set of all triples, without having two-ness and three-ness already there to, to work for you? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so there was a problem in what the very idea of one-to-one -one correspondence they used as a primitive. Um, and later, you know, neo Phrygians use this thing they call, they, they try to avoid set theory, and they use this thing they call Hume's principle, um, which is, the number of Fs equals the number of Gs if and only if there are just as many Fs as they are Gs. But they're using one-to-one -one correspondence too. You got to be able to count. You know, you got to be able to show that there are as many. Um, but that, I mean, it, to me, that's clearly a synthetic principle. It's not. And they that's say right, that's oh, right. this new analytic yeah. principle, and so now we can do neo Phrygian logicism. It's like, dudes, you guys are just Hume's principle is. Is synthetic to the core. That's right. So it's not. That was, that was the point of the uh, the axioms of intuition is is that you have to be able to count numbers of objects before you can apply some all. Yeah. Well, counting operations are primitive recursive functions, right? And so, I mean, my view is that primitive recursive functions are synth are synthetic operations, like fundamentally intuitional synthetic operations. Um, and require, roughly speaking, human experience in order to make sense of them. I see. So we have these synthetic ex experiential, perceptual, cognitive things, and then we try as hard as we can to remove everything that can't be assimilated to pure mechanical formal systems and say, look, now we have um, a better grasp of things. Yeah, or, or somehow an adequate explanation of the phenomenon it was we were trying to uh, account for. Because recursive mechanical systems are in a way like self-generating, and maybe it's, maybe it's the process of self-generation that, that lends them something like uh, like a svabhava in, in Indian metaphysics, the self-standingness, self-sufficiency. Yes, or well, and I think it was you know the, the search for these systems and the search for these uh, you know um, transformative analyses of arithmetic was because Frege wanted to get to the essence of rationality. That's why, you know, he wanted to learn about, you know, reason's own inquiry or whatever, you know, whatever his phrase was. And he thought that logic would do it. And so then he was looking for a set of specifically logical principles, but he falsely assumed that set theory was of logic, like part of logic, whereas really, to the extent that set theory works, and of course it does work, if you you know make it non-paradoxical, uh, and you have you know, to add the axiom of choice, right? That's the big problem. Uh, yes, I mean you've got to have. Well, it's got to be well grounded too. So um, you can't you can't allow it to 
you know, generate the paradoxes. So, um, so if you're using, you know, ZFC or whatever, um, that's got C as choice, right? right. So, um, so ZFC, I, it seems to me, I haven't really studied it closely enough, but it looks to me like uh, Zermelo Frankel did for set theory basically what Gödel did for interesting. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they found a way of uh, accepting, uh, you know, impredicativity, and then, uh, you know, putting in putting basic principles into set theory so that you didn't get into these impredicative loops um, that cause paradox. So, so Frege was thought that the the inferential system, like Kant does this, right? What's the most scientific of all sciences? The, the, the one that has had the least change in history. What's that logic? It's completely transparent. We can't live without it, and it hasn't changed. We know all about it. So Frege thought <clears throat> inference is prior to intuition, I guess, right? More basic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, Frege was a, you know, uh, um, a conce an ultra-conceptualist. Uh, avant la lettre. So, you know, you didn't have that terminology, but he had uh, absorbed from the Kantian tradition that there was a conceptual side to, you know, human reasoning um, and what he wanted to do, and that logic was bound up with that conceptual side to human reasoning. And what he wanted to do was take all a priori science and you know, all formal science and reduce it to the conceptual side of um, of human reasoning. And, and concepts are defined as functions that serve the higher purpose of inference. They are. And, and so, it, so it's Frege's notion of an object that's really a mess in a way. Um, and, you know, the concept object distinction is a mess um, and has, you know, the concept horse is not a concept, you know, um, because the concept horse is actually an object that falls under this more general concept you know so there are all these there are all these versions of paradox that arise in, in the de denotation of propositions is the true and the false right right well that's yeah and he never could say precisely what the truth yeah that was so upsetting we, we learned that in our analytic uh, uh right. survey class and we never spent any time on what the hell does that mean yeah well and that's in part because nobody really knows what they mean and the, but the true and the false they belong in the third realm and yet they somehow characterize, you know, the relationship between propositions and object, you know, concepts and objects and judgments and objects and how that can be is, you know, one of the many puzzles of, or not one of the absolutely many, but because so a great many parts of Frege's view are beautifully clear, make right distinctions and so on. But there are these places like, you know, uh, axiom five in his set theory um, and the notion of the true and the false um, and his theory of truth generally, not surprisingly, um, his notion of what he calls logical definitions in the, um, the anal his account of what an analytic proposition is, um, the status of the laws of logic because he defines analyticity in terms of derivability from the general laws of logic, either from the general laws of logic alone or from the general laws of logic together with logical definitions. And he never really tells us what a logical definition is, nor does he explain why the laws of logic, well, by that definition, since the general laws of logic are not derivable from the general laws of logic, they ground the gen, you know, they ground derivability they're not analytic. Oh, that's right. They're, they're just a, a mysterious basic given. They're, they're a basic given, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so there are various parts of Frege's view that have these um, puzzles and in some cases paradox producing uh, consequences. Um, but it, you know, but it's in a way it's, he tried to conceptualize that which cannot be conceptualized because it's fundamentally non-conceptual um, and intuitional in Kant's sense, whereas a prop, in my view anyway, uh, my two cents worth is... He was committing an amphiboly. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, he's making a huge mistake. It was a reductive mistake. Uh, and the correct conception of both logic and mathematics uh, combines 
essentially non-conceptual together with essentially conceptual elements. And so in the philosophy of the future, uh, there's going to have to be more emphasis on this phenomenological. We're going to have to, I mean, we're going to have to have like beings like, like the navigators in Dune. They're going to have to be like super meditators that are super sensitive. They're, they're somatic interior states and how they'd eventually become propositional contents or even, even presences, right? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be that mystical in a way. They just have to have the same kind of uh, what I would call formal piety that uh, Gödel and Tarski, although they didn't quite formulate it this way, and I think probably Zermelo and Frankel did, with respect to the you know content domains that they were thinking about, um, but be able to generalize from that kind of thinking to uh, what I call natural piety, which would incorporate these you know non-mechanical elements into physics, but also situate physical mechanical systems in this larger structural um, framework. Also, they would have to have the same kind of uh, piety that, say, Cantor did when he, you know, realized that, you know, the natural numbers and the rational numbers are systematically embedded within real number system, you know, this, this super rich real number system. And I guess the hope is that this type of revelation in the highest of all the sciences would make it the most legitimate type of thing. And then hopefully this would seep and have cultural, social, political, institutional effects, maybe, right? Just yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thought. Uh, that the creative piety in general will show up the same kinds of, in general terms, the same kinds of intellectual, and uh, you know, uh, moves in thinking and not just thinking in the conceptual sense, but thinking together with, you know, non-conceptual cognition will show up over and over and over again uh, in social, political, artistic, fine artistic and applied artistic, basically in every part of everyday life, including personal relationships and all the rest of it, all this, this, this right, kind right. of, yeah. Um, and then that's where, you know, the thought is, wow, we could move towards a philosophy of the future of that sort, taking on board all these. Right, right. And then philosophy would, would be grounding not just arithmetic, but it, it would be uh, like the the uh, it would be like the thesis on Feuerbach. It would be grounding like the improvement of it, actually the quality of life. It would somehow. Have well, to... yeah, it would be like the Marx thing, right? It wouldn't philosophy wouldn't be just interpreting the world. It would be you know, my ad is life changing and then world changing in virtue of life changing. The, the point you're making reminds me of uh, uh, Jacob Bernowski. Uh, so um, tonight I'm, I'm hosting a meetup where we cover episode eight, which is one of my favorite episodes in, in the series, The Ascent of Man. In this one, he talks about the, the discovery that, pa that power was fungible during the English Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. Chemical, solar, thermal, right. and mechanical were all interchangeable. And this led to romanticism and the identification of the subjective energy, the interior, the vis viva of inside, or the, 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 the life force, with energy outside. And this was the great unification of subject and object in nature or romanticism. It's a great episode. Right. Uh, and, and before that, he talked about uh, uh, the Newtonian, Keplerian, Kantian revolution, which, which takes the uh, experiential physical reality and finally simulates it to geometry, which is the clearest in all, of, of all the sciences. But then in the second to last episode, Bernowski makes a point you're making right now where he talks about how the indeterminacy in quantum mechanics should be leveraged to avoid things like the Holocaust. And he actually takes the crew down to Auschwitz. And as, he, as he's talking about this, he's like, and he was friends with, with some of these physicists. And he says it was, the, it was the certainty that the Germans had that the Jews weren't people, which led them to mechanically and, and just automatically and, ban and banally, as um, Hannah Arendt says, just execute them. And then he walks with his shoes into a, a pile of ashes. And he gets down and he picks it up and, the, and just the crew started weeping. It's a really, really intense episode. Wow. Yeah, that sounds like great stuff. And, you know, Prigogini says similar things in The End of Certainty, too, sort of. The, you know, the, the um, physic, me mechanistic physics is 
wrong in a way highly close to the way that social institutions designed on mechanical principles are not right. impressive. Yeah. And the determ determinism itself, you, you could see it as being like a, a motivator for a political spectator citizenship, right? Where you're like, yeah, everything yeah. happens the way it happens. God is in charge. You know, conservatives use all the time. God elected Trump. God is in charge. God was in charge when Hitler was in power. Wasn't he Jews? I mean, this is God's plan. So so it, it makes people uh, into good, obedient spectators to, to be mechanistic and deterministic. Yes. Yep. So as Prigogini says, it's it's only two steps from mechanistic physics to 1984. Oh, yeah. That's even better. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, my walk is coming up. I know. I know it is. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, we went over time today, but this That's is. Okay. Yeah. I, I never thought we'd have a better talk than we had last week, but we did. Uh, and uh, geez, I really love these talks. Yeah, me too. So I'm looking forward to next week. <laughs> yep. And, uh, same time, same bat channel. Right? Yep. Enjoy your walk. Yep. Thanks, Scott. Take yep. care. Yep. Yep.